Good afternoon, everybody. Who? Who? This is sort of weird with the long, I, I got to say. So who's a Mongo developer, uses Mongo on a regular basis? A couple people. Uh, and uh, other NoSQL databases like CouchDB or stuff like that? Uh, any of the Bizarro graph databases, which I shouldn't call Bizarro because they're really cool, but I don't use them. <laughs> okay, and so presumably you all know enough Python that this is not going to be completely baffling. This is not like your first day of Python. Um, in addition to working um, for um, Capital One, um, I'm also a writer uh, for packed books, so I have a, a bunch of books zero of which are about NoSQL databases. So these are all, you know, basically just straight up Python. Uh, no apologies. Um, so what I want to talk about is what a schema really is and why we need it, you know. What's important are the ways we have to represent a schema. And in particular in the no schema database world, you've got two fundamental choices, code, because after all, Python as a descriptive uh, kind of DSL sort of thing for data is fabulous. So uh, why not use that? Uh, plus, there's the additional not code ways to represent metadata. And we'll, and we'll look at those too, because it, it, um, uh, there's not one size uh, that fits all perfectly well. Uh, size 9, good for me. May not be good for you. I'm going to talk about uh, some real code code. I mean, we're going to look at a Python meta class, which may be a little advanced for some people, but uh, it works really well for me, so I'm, I'm happy with it. Um, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the more complex uh, problems in NoSQL database world is I have to make a change to the schema that is not backwards compatible. The data or something, the app, will break fatally if I don't do this correctly. And uh, this applies even to CSV files. Because, after all, how much schema information is in a CSV file? M maybe the first row has headings, and that's it. Uh, sometimes you want a little more than just headings. And, of course, the worst case, your CSV file has no headings. It's just pure data. And then it's like, oh, is this one latitude or longitude? Uh, I don't know, they look like numbers to me. You know, so one's negative, so I'm guessing that's probably latitude. Could be anything. So what's a schema, and, and why am I stuck with it? The, uh, what happens in the SQL world is that there is a very formal, carefully thought through idea dating from the 1960s. All of you are too young to remember that era. I was there. And it was, I, I'm going to sit on my lawn in my chair and shake my fist at you children, too. But what happens is in the early days, um, they divided the world into three bits. There was the user bit, and, and uh, you know, I think I can even do this before I can do that. Oh, that's so cool. Um, except that's the wrong slide, so let's just go back. Yeah, don't mess with it. Um, uh, so there's, you know, this user view. Um, or externalized view. There's the logical or the conceptual model. Terminology varies a little bit. And then there's the physical implementation model. And in um, tools like Irwin, when you apply column data types, they call that a physical model. It's not. It's a logical model with column data types. It's garbage. Um, the physical model is like Oracle table spaces and DB2, whatever it is, DB2 stores your data in. It's physical. It's where it sits on the disk. It's file system stuff. Um, so the subtlety is that there's schema and there's schema. Um, when you go to look at the data, there's stuff you know or might know or hope you know about the data that isn't represented anywhere. Uh, there could be a company policy or some other foolishness that influences very deeply what this data might mean. And I, I don't see that written down in any SQL anywhere. Um, of course, uh, derived data, <laughs> which is a violation of third normal form. But let, let, let me call anybody bad for doing that. It happens all the time. We've got tons of derived data calculating things in there. Uh, and non-normalized stuff, um, plus the, the star schema versus transaction normalization and things like that. So um, don't get too involved in thinking that the schema is everything because it's, it's several things, all kind of collected together conceptually in one bucket. Um, ultimately, 
in NoSQL world, the user schema, what the user thinks they see, and the logical schema that's in the database have been merged together into one thing, the document data structure. Much simpler. The physical schema is generally something that is completely invisible to you. And with the good databases like Mongo and Couch, you have no idea how that's physically represented on disk, and you're happy never to know. Uh, you didn't want to know. So SQL world is somewhat simpler, but what's important is that in the NoSQL world, it didn't simply vanish. It is still totally there. It just doesn't happen to be in your face all the time, and so you have to manage the thing. So NoSQL gives us some flexibility uh, that uh, SQL didn't really have, but both have a schema. And so then the, the subtle question sometimes becomes, so what was the big win? Why, why did I give up a SQL database? What, what am I getting out of this? And the funny thing about the SQL database is that your schema exists in a variety of places. And it really does exist in a variety of places. Um, you create table statements, some internal representation in the database, in your code, your SQL code, and the schema is reflected in your non-SQL code too, and don't let anybody lie to you about that. Well, you know, I write this Java that's super clean and never reflects any aspect of the schema. It's using the columns, is it not? Is it not using the columns? Then it reflects the schema in some sense. So don't tell me your code is independent of any schema. That's stupid. We'll come back to this. <laughs> so if the schema's not right, or you don't understand the schema, or there's some weird mismatch between the schema as defined on a piece of paper and the schema as represented in the database, you wind up with queries that do full table scans and Cartesian products. This is all sort of normal awfulness that happens. Um, you can have application programs that don't work because it gets weird SQL errors that that's not a date. I didn't know it had to be a date. I thought it was a string. Somebody lied to me. Um, select statements that don't work as advertised. We all, we all have seen that kind of thing. And it gets worse. Because if the schemas don't all line up right, then we're having to wait around while app devs and database devs all not talk to each other because they were busy that week or there was a production problem and they're still not busy and they won't talk to me anyway and stuff like that. What we do a lot of times is we make just a bare minimum schema, enough to make it work and nothing more so that we don't have to deal with this problem. Which is why we then switch to a NoSQL database so that the schema are all merged together and we don't have to deal with this problem either. A different way of not dealing with it. We can add extra layers, too, to try to uh, close the gap between the DML statements in our code and the defined schema, which, oh, by the way, is yet another representation of the schema, bringing us up to a total of five copies of the full thing. So here's what I want to talk about. In Python world, in a NoSQL database where there is not a official schema, but there still is a schema, conceptually, you've got to have an idea of what the data looks like. I want to have a defined schema. I want to have a defined schema in the code because code is cool. I don't want to have it somewhere else floating around in the database where I can't find it very easily. I want to have it, if possible, stated exactly once so that there's no real mystery about what's going on there. And so I'll show you um, three techniques that I think get you to this world. So the first thing is uh, the schema representation issue that we gotta figure out what we wanna write down. I have two broad categories of things. We can write the schema down as pure um, code, like Python, um, or we can have some separate metadata, maybe hidden in the code. After all, Python is triple quoted strings. I can put giant amounts of data inside a Python file and then maybe parse it separately. Not saying I haven't done that more than once. Um, I, I can put it in separate files. I can actually put it in a Mongo collection. Why not? If I'm careful about my schema, I can actually put it in the database and have the program fetch the full thing. I'm going to advertise up front that this is sort of where I like to head. And so the idea of cleanly separate metadata still embedded in the code makes me very happy because now I know where to look for everything. One GitHub repo, it's all there. How much better can it be? So, here's the ad hoc pure code thing. I have, um, yes, this is undesirable. I've got sort of what amounts to schema information because I, you know, I made a connection to the database. 
uh, I opened some um, collection in that database, uh, I did a find, and now I'm mentioning a column name that I assert, implicitly I'm asserting this must exist in every row. Should it fail to exist, we die in a key error. Bammo, and that's unpleasant. It makes me very unhappy. Because at three o'clock in the morning, Chris calls me up and says, Steve, the database died. Chris, I'm not sober. <laughs> uh, you know, this it, is just, just, just full of ad hoc implied schema documented nowhere. You gotta basically search for every variable <laughs> which appears to be an instance of a collection to figure out what the implied schema is, and, and that um, uh, is uh, doomed. So what they do a lot of times for this pure code thing is they'll define a class and you'll have a mapping between some, uh, what Mongo uses internally, vSAN documents and, and your application objects, and that's not so bad. Um, there's a Java version of that, we'll skip over Java for now. So there's, you know, like Mongo Engine, and there's uh, Mongo Kit, and some other kinds of things that we can use. Um, they're remarkably simple. And they're not exactly like object relational mapping, because in object relational mapping, your uh, relational database has to imply structure through this bizarre, deranged, insane scheme called foreign keys. And so you have multiple tables that are somehow collated together by virtue of some key relationship or something I don't even know anymore. I'm too old to remember that stuff. Um, and uh, so object relational mapping in the relational world, I'm trying to reconstruct an object from stuff that's in multiple tables with multiple key relationships. Craziness. Here, the document's already structured. Very clean and simple mapping between uh, a database document and a NoSQL database and a Python structure. Thank goodness. So here's the Mongo Engine example. You know, I create some class of some defined thing from Mongo Engine, and I define my fields and things like that. There will be an implicit uh, save method that comes along for the ride, and the save method persists things in the database. This is really, really elegant. There's not too much bad to be said about this, but I think we can do a little better. And the reason I think we can do a little better is this involves a certain amount of overhead in mapping between Mongo's internal data structures and the Python sort of implied data structures in these class definitions, and it's just a layer of fuzziness that isn't really helpful, it just sort of slows things down a little. So in, in that style of thing, where, where does the information the database The information about the connection to the database doesn't live in this defined class at all. When you open up uh, Mongo Engine to use the full thing, then you'll say, I want to get one of these classes out of this collection uh, to do a find, or if I want to persist something, the save has a way to map into a specific collection of the Mongo database. Yes, yeah, they're, they're done uh, separately. And the different ones, Mongo Kit and the other things, they all have slightly different ways of handling this exact problem because it's an annoying problem. Thank you. <laughs> Only this mic. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So my preference is schema as separate kind of metadata. Um, there's two common representations for this, the uh, XML schema definition, XSD, which is wordy, and XMLE, and, and kind of bleh, XML. Uh, so I would much prefer JSON, because JSON looks like Python, or Python looks like JSON. I don't know which came first, chickens, eggs, I, whatever. Um, I mean, it's JavaScript notation, but give me a break. Somebody was reading off somebody else's playbook when they decided that a dictionary in Python would look almost exactly like a dictionary in JavaScript, and, and therefore we have a pleasant symmetry here. So there's a whole JSON schema organization. Everybody here familiar with Swagger specifications? Nobody? Nobody? Good. Good. That's okay. I, I, it's okay. You, you, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> but if you know what the Swagger specifications are, then you know a little bit about the JSON schema org, because that is the um, kernel underneath Swagger specifications. Um, and so there's a Python package that I really like, the JSON schema package, that implements a validator for JSON schema documents, which is sort of the backbone for validating Swagger documents. So here's the three places that you could conceivably put schema information. I think all three of these have certain advantages, and I've used them randomly, uh, and so uh, different people on different projects say, well, I thought it was better to, well, yeah, that was Thursday it was better. 
Today's Friday, so today we're putting it in the schema, uh, in the collection, in the database. Yeah, but last Wednesday you said we could put it in an external JSON file. You sure can. Enjoy. That was last Wednesday. Today is not Wednesday anymore. So um, the idea of having schema as a big old actual literal Python dictionary, no parsing, no funny business, you write the thing out, um, there's essentially no overhead. It's just a dictionary in a class definition. Mm. And um, other ones where you have like an external file that you have to read or you have to go find the full thing in a collection in the database, ew, these are touchy because there's a kind of an overhead and so you gotta, gotta fetch the full thing. With some cleverness, you only fetch it once, but you know, it, it's work. The cost is non-zero. So, recap in the middle. NoSQL doesn't mean no schema. You always have a schema. It's the ad hoc schema, schema implied in code, that is a very bad idea. VBI, three letter acronym, easy to remember, very bad idea. Uh, NoSQL lets us have just a single schema. I think we should always try to put it in the code. I think the JSON schema is the right way to do business. I'm not 100% sure that the Mongo engine schema as class definition is any better. Uh, I think the JSON schema has a few tiny advantages. So, we'll move on to, oh, that, that's sort of internal stuff. If you happen to be here um, uh, in our internal GitHub, I have a thing that'll convert back and forth from Java to JSON and Python and, and this and that. And it'll generate Java code from JSON schema and stuff. Who cares? Um, get on to the good stuff. So, use cases. The things we need to do. Design and modeling time, we got to get to the point where we can get an idea into code and you don't just sit down and wipe that on a whiteboard because that writing the design down on a whiteboard and commencing to code is death waiting to happen because whatever you wrote down on that whiteboard may have some performance question that you didn't answer or worse yet, you answered it really glibly. Of course this will be fast. Says who? Of course, it's obvious. Obvious that it's painfully. Why are you so dense? This will be fast. It'll run like lightning. And then, you know, you load up some data and uh, <clears throat> perhaps you're a little overly glib on the fast part about that. So my, uh, we'll talk. Uh, data validation, checking a document before you save it in the database. Mm. Mongo imposes, of course, no constraints at all. So you can have a collection of random garbage. Each document in that collection a unique creative work of art, a statement from my very soul. Unique, handcrafted, artisanal data. Artisanal drinks made from bourbon are one thing. You consume them and the night vanishes. You wake up on Sunday with an Uber bill you can't imagine in a place in Delaware you didn't know existed. Wondering how did I get an Uber all the way to Delaware? I didn't even think Delaware was a state. I'm having doubts now. So schema data validation uh, with some level of formality <laughs> in a NoSQL database I think has advantages. And I think that anything you can do to get a sense of what all those documents are supposed to be is worth its weight in gold, which is how I got started on this whole thing in the first place. How do we validate what's in the database before it gets into the database, before I wake up in Delaware? And then the schema migration, which is a, a, a fairly difficult thing, but we ought to confirm the collection is what we thought it was going to be, make whatever non-backwards compatible transformation we're going to make, document by document, until it's ready for the new version 4.0 of our app, and then maybe just check it after the change to make sure every single document is really compatible with the 4.0 version of my app, because the worst thing that you could do then is turn the old API on live, you've done the feature toggle and the green version all crashes in flames. So that, that would be, a lot of bad things can happen if you don't do this well. So my idea is that you really ought to um, 
commit the design to a schema fairly slowly. And in particular, with Python, you have the unique ability to um, basically build technology spikes left, right, and center. Let's model it like this. Okay, let's actually write the damn documents, pardon my French, let's write the documents, let's put them in the database, let's fetch them out of the database, let's simulate a volume and say, what are we gonna have, a million of them, two million of them? I think I can write a for loop, for i in range one million, and generate random data and build documents and stuff them in the database and we'll see what happens. And you do your silly find and your aggregate and whatever your other aggregation was and the aggregation you couldn't explain, blah, 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 we'll write one and we'll see what it does. Oh, that one takes 15 minutes. I guess maybe we need some indexes. Or maybe we need a completely different data structure so that the aggregation actually works in a finite amount of time. These are discussions you should have early and often and Python gives you the unique ability to, in a few minutes, bang out an example and say, well, there, here it is, and it doesn't work, or here it is, it works great. Tweak the scripts until they work. You can even use them for performance testing. Whatever you use to generate a million random rows, you can continue that right on through to production time, and, and when you have the new version and the version 4.0 and the version 5.0, your random data scrambler ought to still work. And then, once it's gotten to the point where you have some confidence in it, okay, now I'm going to write a formal schema, make a swagger specification out of it, build some APIs, and we'll go on to the, the interesting coding part that we generally delegate to somebody else because as scientists, we generally don't do all the coding. We make programmers do that. That's me. And uh, so it would be nice to have had this conversation sort of in an offline mode as opposed to just random mode. We can build prototypes and look at them. And then um, we can create code that works because we have uh, had a chance to dry run the whole thing a little bit. As far as data validation is concerned, this is my nirvana end state script that I have some data coming in, value, 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 whatever the values are, however I got them reading CSV files or whatever the heck happened to those things. I want to build an instance of a class and if that instance cannot be built because it violates some definition in the schema, I wanted to raise an exception and that's the end of that. So then we can, you know, do whatever it is, print out an error or something like that or return a 404 or something, whatever, if it's a web app, I don't, I don't know. If I can build an instance of the class, then I'm happy inserting it in the database. If I can't build an instance of the class, I should do nothing more. And I like this as the, the objective, this is where we want to go to. I want simple programming like this. Uh, the question occasionally comes up, shouldn't we use an if statement to determine if it's valid? And the answer is, raising exceptions like this is faster than writing if statements. The exception handling in Python is fast, if statements are not as fast. So just do it like this. Here's the other one, overall schema validation. Uh, for some object in my database collection, uh, try to build the internal class representation of that object. If it works, it's compliant with the schema that's part of that class. If it doesn't work, then the object, the document you got out of the database, can't be used to build the internal Python representation of it. Something's wrong with the database. Or something's wrong with the schema, you, you tell me. I, I really don't know how the database got into that condition. So now you're gonna have to look at that document to find out who touched that last and why did they touch it manually. Chris. It was 3 o'clock in the morning and it needed to get up and running and it was just a date. Just a once. We're a bank so that never actually happens. But we talk about what if, uh, like it might happen. But, you know, uh, actual uh, production data, there's so many eyeballs watching you looking at the production data that, you know, we laugh about what if it gets tweaked. And, and generally you get kind of intellectually lazy because it, it sort of can't be. It would take a, a million people to go tweak production data in, invalidly. Uh, what more often happens is I broke a unit test and fudged the answer and we got on and went into production and some rows went in with something that didn't actually pass the unit tests correctly, which is the same thing as tweaking it manually because I, I fudged something. Okay, so what's really involved in getting those two blocks of code to work nicely? I'm going to define a class in Python. It is going to implement some basic CRUD rules, create, retrieve, update, and delete. 
uh, the in, in Mongo, those are insert one, find one, replace one, and delete one. So I have the canonical CRUD rules, uh, and we can look at a class that will do all of this uh, pretty elegantly. There's a tricky part. Mongo has an update that is really clever in what it can do inside the database. The problem is that it's difficult to figure out how to make a series of um, property changes to an instance of a class into the sequence of commands to update that object in Mongo. Um, and, uh, and so for people who are not Mongo programmers, it's like, what? And for the people who are Mongo programmers, it's like, do you have to use update one? So we'll leave the tricky part out for now. So here's uh, the superclass for all of these things that is defines my model. This is all the code there is, almost, uh, by the way. It's, it's this short. So we're using built-in features of uh, Mongo, the BSON Sun class. Um, it's their version of JSON. When you see the documents, they're represented in JSON. When they're in the database, they're actually in a binary version of JSON they call BSON. And the BSON uh, library that you get with PyMongo handles that conversion seamlessly between database binary and the JSON you expect to see. So that's a lovely thing. I, I'm just going to build on it. I, I'm not going to invent anything new. That, that I'm lazy that way. The meta class we'll come back to in a sec. The um, schema itself is just a big old dictionary. Schema, title, description, blah, 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 version, collection, mm, nothing special to it. Um, it's a JSON schema document, literally, encoded as a dictionary. There are two little extensions that I want to talk about, the version and the collection. Uh, they're not, not, not anything too interesting. Instance validation is a line of code. This, I'm going to use the JSON schema library. I'm going to have it do its validate thing on the object. If it is all valid, we're good. Nothing else happens. Silently succeeds. Love it. If it's not valid and breaks any of the schema definition rules, big old exception is thrown and I can't create an instance of the object because it's invalid. And this is the fact that I had to write one line of code to implement things. I'm loving that. And then there's some malarkey down here to um, dump the class out in a kind of a generic way. Um, doesn't involve too much uh, serious Python magic. Uh, it just kind of looks long and wordy, but you can uh, get the code off um, GitHub and, and uh, play with it a little bit. So the key value proposition is it's all just an internal BSON document, a thing PyMongo gave me that I did just wrapped a little bit of stuff around. My life is very simple. And the other part of it is that, I mean, that reduces the serialization overhead considerably. It also means that the JSON schema that is in that class definition can become part of my Swagger specification by a simple, oh, it's the schema object inside the class and put it here in the Swagger document, put this one here in the Swagger document. And it involves no real thinking to make sure that the Swagger document actually reflects the implementation directly, no mysteries. And for those of you who are serious Python gurus, uh, this is the meta class. Um, I actually build uh, three internal class level uh, variables. The collection name, the MongoDB collection, comes out of the schema using the extension. Um, the version comes out of the schema using the X version extension. And the Python doc string is the schema description it, that was in the JSON schema. So you don't actually write a doc string for the class, I make a doc string for the class. And that way, the schema definition doc string is the class doc string, no confusion. Everything is all in exactly one place. We just have two references to it. So here's what it would look like. So here's my resource class for random resource that is something that is a dimensional model or I don't know what it is, something that we got from credit card data or something. And so, you know, you, you write out the title because JSON schema documents usually have titles and we write a, a description that, that is the JSON schema description. We write a X version because this is version one and we write the X collection, the Mongo collection we want it to be in. Uh, almost all of these things are of type object. There's a bunch of properties and there's some required properties. 
and the required is part of the validation rules that's imposed on this. And then in the small font that you can barely read, um, there's IDs and resource names and resource other things and statuses and approvers and I don't even know what all's going on in there and it's uh, got a nested object and an array of items and all kinds of malarkey going on. Holy cow, this is great stuff. Um, the really interesting bit, very small font, a pattern. Just, you know, a thing that is used for data validation, that if this string does not follow that um, regular expression pattern, then um, validation error. And it happens all in the JSON schema thing. I didn't write any code to make that happen. I only had to write it once in the definition of what I expect the record or the documents to look like. So the object lifecycle is, I'm going to define a class that has the schema. I'm going to create documents that are instances of that class. If I fail to create the document, then that attempted document creation violated a constraint defined in the JSON schema. And I can stuff things into the collection. I can use Mongo pretty directly uh, without having to think about it because the documents are already in Mongo's preferred BSON notation. No extra overheads. My life is much simpler. The really tricky bit here, schema migration, generally, the whole point about this is uh, as we go forward from version 1.04 to version 2.01, uh, how do we do this? There's a couple of things we can do. We can coexist or we can do a, a conversion. Um, coexistence means that we'll have just two different collections with two different collection names. This is just a Mongo technique that works well. Um, we're not all Mongo people, so who cares? Um, schema migration is the interesting one. I've got all these documents in my database that I uh, uh, want to claim work for the version 1 schema. I want to convert them to the version 2 schema, save them in a new collection, and then I want to validate the version 2 schema and say, yes, it really is correct. Every one of those documents works against the new schema definition. And you'll notice that I call them, you know, 01 and 02, and everything's an 01 and an 02. And you want to put that right in the class names in front of God and everybody that this is the version 1 class definition. This is the version 2 class definition. You're not going to modify a class. You're going to introduce a new class. And they're going to live side by side, at least for the duration of this, and possibly longer because you may have legacy data that you're doing some analytics on and newer data that you're doing ever so slightly different analytics on because the schemas are different. And so you have both class definitions and that way it's very clear that this is the version one data and this is the version two data. And the version one data doesn't have the geolocation, but the version two does. And in the version one, we approximate geolocation using the zip code. And in the version two, we have the actual number and we can kind of combine them knowing that there's a huge error in the version one data, but for what your model does, it might work. And there's a way to handle downtime with um, blue screen modification. So, it may be a NoSQL database, but you still have a schema. You cannot escape that sort of law of the land because it's at least in your code in the way you deal with the database. So, I figure as long as it's going to be in your code, put it in the code for real. Write a JSON schema document, put it in a class definition, use it to validate instances of the class, use it to validate documents in the database, uh, use it for as much as you can. Uh, prior to any insert or replace, before and after major database migration changes, it's, uh, it, it saves you lots and lots of agony. Questions? Yes? If I was not using Mongo, I would still leverage the BSON, depending on the complexity of my documents. If they truly are nested, you know, documents with subdocuments and arrays of subdocuments, all not in any normal form, I would still use the BSON thing. PyMongo is pretty cool, and the BSON class definition works really nicely. You can use a simple ordered dict instead of BSON, and you'll get many of the same benefits. Uh, BSON serializes more things than an ordered dict will depending on what you're doing. And if you're using something very flat like CSV files, um, the super class for that thing is list. And uh, you just treat everything as a list. Or if you're going to use a dict reader to read stuff out of you know, CSV files, then the super class could be a plain old dict. It'll just be very flat. But oh yeah, any one of those super classes is good.
absolutely. You could uh, manipulate a field and produce garbage after you got it from the database, because the validation only happens when we get it from the database or just before we persist it. So yeah, you could certainly reduce it to garbage, but you can add a validate check before the replace. And then so the, when you uh, write your own version of replace or, or make sure you do it all the time, um, there's no, or, or add an explicit validate method. There's a couple of things you could do to make sure you hadn't made garbage out of it along the way. Every single gets a little tedious, uh, mostly because it's not very fast, and so you would you would pay a, a huge penalty for that. Um, my preference is if you're going to modify records and there's some doubt in the back of your mind that it may somehow break the validation, you really need to unit test the willies out of that and not be worrying about runtime. Um, the uh, you need to have a lot more confidence uh, than just runtime checks uh, because if it breaks at runtime. You don't have any way to diagnose it if you didn't have unit tests to tell you what's broken. So you, you wind up having to go pretty back far down the road. Um, so if you have multiple versions of the validation checking, um, are you just only importing data that matches the most recent one, or are you maintaining at all which, like in the data row, which uh, documentation it validates against? Yes, you often will wind up having to put an extra attribute in there, like underscore class which has the name of the class. And that way, when you do a find, you take the class attribute and you say, oh, it's one of these. And, um, and, and that's uh, not, not a bad hack. Um, the, the Java people do that all the time, and it doesn't bother them. Um, my preference is that you shouldn't have too many variations in a single collection in Mongo world, but sometimes you do. And so then you put an extra attribute in there as a key to figure out what the, the type is. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions on meta classes? Please don't ask. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. The JSON validator will not allow you to make a bad Python object because the JSON representation is, is so very limited, as is BSON, in that it can only really make dictionaries and lists. And it can only make dictionaries and lists of um, a dozen or so primitive types. And 80% of your Mongo data is going to be strings. Some will be integers, a few numbers, and once in a while a Boolean here and there, some dates and things that you might want to have converted to date time. So any other validation above and beyond the JSON schema validation um, is unlikely to be necessary. I suppose you could have some really sophisticated constraint that needs to be implemented also. But that would be just you know another line of code to make sure that this is always twice that or some other kind of thing that you can't express in, in JSON schema. Oh, go back. This was a better picture. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, the update thing, what would have to happen with update is you have a, an object and it has um, uh, s the, the uh, total uh, credit card so far this month. So you taking from some other collection, I've got a new credit card transaction, I'm going to add to this. So in Python world, you know, property, you know, some object x dot balance plus equals some amount. You don't think twice about it. And so Python is going to uh, take the old value of the balance, add the amount, put it back in as, a, as an attribute in there, seamlessly, silently, and you don't really have any record of what was changed. Essentially, you have a whole new document. Now, you can replace the entire Mongo document, but that sort of seems silly because it was only a balance and it was incremented. So if you knew it was being incremented, you could have generated a Mongo update one that says, on this document, in this field, increment this property by this much. And Mongo would then do that update, just that one add, the document would be left in place and it would be extremely fast. Um, but it's difficult when you're assigning a property value, even if you have a, a um, decorator to catch the property setter, 
you still don't know what changed. Was it really an ad? Because you can't see the rest of the expression that was going on out there. You could deduce that it was an ad by doing a subtraction and saying, oh, it must have been an ad. But maybe it was a set. We were just setting a new value without doing arithmetic. But I can't tell. And so the update thing, Mongo gives you some power that doesn't trivially get deduced uh, by any class definition because it would need to know more about the application than a, than a class ever really knows because all it knows is set and get. Yes? You have um, none of that. Um, because in the NoSQL database, it's just a document, essentially a dictionary. Um, and so the collection just has to hold dictionaries. That's it. That's the only rule. And the, you have one, in Mongo, you have one mandatory field, couch is similar, uh, underscore ID, and that's all you're going to see. And uh, everything else is completely on you and your application to make sure that if I'm going to have a property, it has a consistent type. And you have to write all that in your code anyway. So now the question is, how can I get that representation so that that information is in exactly one place and every different use case uses the one and only definition? But there's no formal schema like there is in SQL where I declare a table and say that the name column is a string of up to 64 characters. Mongo, I could put anything I want in there. Maybe I ought to have a property named name, but there's no practical limit on the size of the strings that you can put in there. So you can't limit it to 64. And you don't need to. That a lot of the type definitions in SQL world are old optimizations because when I was young, and we're talking a long time ago now, when I was young, disk was slow and an I-O operation took forever. And so you had to find a way to do the least I.O. you could get away with. So a lot of the schema definitions in a SQL database are part of an old optimization for old slow disks. And uh, a lot of that isn't as helpful as it once was. That's why you have to write JSON schema validators to be sure that data that you're about to put in your database really does fit whatever your definition is and you have that definition in exactly one place and in my opinion not separate from the code, not in the database, in the code so that it's in the GitHub repo and I like having it in the class definition as this JSON schema definition because the JSON schema validator works really, really well. That's the only way you can do it. You have to, it has to be in your code uh, and you, you have to be very disciplined about using it consistently or you have to impose that discipline from outside and this class definition um, imposes that discipline on you because, um, go find my class definition again, um, because this this class definition on this slide will not create an instance unless it passes the schema validation. And this is the way you make yourself very disciplined. You make it impossible to make an instance of the class that doesn't pass the validation. Yeah? Yes the model. So here's my external financial services model and here's my external financial services with whatever vendor, here's my external financial services with whatever other vendor, but they're sharing the model repo so that we have one and only one and that way there's no arguing about that. Yeah, and especially if you have a, a sort of a theoretical microservices world, I have all this flask container that has everything in it, but as a practical matter I'm going to have a second Flask that has to also access this thing. And I've got some batch jobs that live outside Flask. Or, you know, so uh, it, it, the theoretical microservices thing kind of flakes out in reality. And I better have a separate model that I can import from a variety of places. Thank you very much. I think we should get out of here.